Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the study this morning. Uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for all the things you do. We are thankful, Lord, for the part that you have given us in this work in the last days, in reflecting and revealing uh, Christ's character to the world, to those that are in darkness. We invite your presence into this study through thy spirit, that you can speak to each heart. And we ask for your correcting influence. Help us, Lord, to always recognize your voice and to obey it. We pray for each person as we study. You know the particular trials we face. And you know the battles. And we just ask, Lord, that you can continue to fight for us in this controversy with evil. Be with us in this study now. Help us to understand the things we study. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, good morning, everyone. So um, just a little bit of a testimony um, without a lot of detail. But basically, um, the work here uh, in this building is going really well. Um, that means it's very interesting. Um, but we really need your prayers as far as this conflict with evil. So obviously there's evil forces at battle, but it's quite, kind of interesting to watch how God is working upon hearts and the battle that's that's occurring. Satan, of course, is angry, um, so he has his agents also working. So just remember to pray for us in the work that we are doing here. Now, um, We had put on a line, so I'm just going to switch to the camera uh, behind me. So I'll stop the share as well. So this is where we finished off yesterday. <clears throat> and uh, you can see, of course, that uh, here I'm going to switch my microphone. I'll go to the board. So this is, um, you know, we spent a lot of yesterday laying out um, the line there. And I, I think that's pretty solid. Uh, what we see is we see the first and second angel's message of this message of darkness. And um, uh, the first part is basically represented by Shechem, the men of Shechem who are being tested. And just like in Millerite history, you have Protestants and Millerites. Uh, in this, this is kind of, in, in a sense, of reverse, because even though this is the message of Abimelech, Abimelech's not really the one being tested, it's the men of Shechem. And then as the men of Shechem uh, rebel against Abimelech, then Abimelech is being tested. And so in these tests, they're, they're really failing these tests. Right. That is, uh, you know, being killed is kind of a failure in Abimelech's case. And then these people, even though they recognize Abimelech is in error, um, that's the men of Shechem, uh, they're going to then still be uh, on the wrong side of the issue, even though they've rejected this. And so we have. Uh, oh, I spelled that wrong. Oh. And um, which is this bitterness. And that's the hey. message of Paul. Yeah. Can't, Theodore, can you make that a little bigger? Or? Nope. I can't. Okay. There's nothing I can do. I mean, you can put it on your full screen, but if you have a small device, it's just going to be small. But it, it's easy to see on a computer. As long as you have it... Um, uh, you know, HD, if you have enough uh, um, speed. I, I get it. It's recording. I get it later. Yeah. 
Now, um, so then what we did is we laid out how this relates to our movement. And so some of these things we're not 100% certain on. Um, you know, we've laid them out, and I think some, th some of these things are, are fairly solid. Now, what we had here is when you have, um, and some of these things I added. So this is uh, the prediction and FFA, uh, the prediction. Uh, that's, I don't know why that looks so funny. But this is the prediction of July 18th. I, I'm not sure what I wrote there. Predict. Is that what that is, is just predict? I think it was supposed to be, but I... Anyway, I couldn't read it. So they predict July 18th, right? That's the message of Gideon, the prediction of July 18th. And the death of Gideon is uh, the end of FFA's prediction regarding July 18th. That is, once July 18th occurs, we're not going to be predicting July 18th anymore. It also is the end of FFA, at least uh, the beginning of it, right? So one way we could look at this, um, you know, is FFA ends, but then we're going to have this light that's going to come, right? So from July 18th, we have this light. Now, this light is going to be attacked, right? So that's what's happening here in this story. That's what's happening here. Now, this meeting is October 30th, correct, Dwight? Right, <clears throat> correct. Yeah, on the biblical calendar, it's the eighth month and the 13th day, right? There's other things about it as well. Um, but it represents 813, Daniel 813, which is Palmoni, right? Right. And, and that's what's going to be attacked specifically. Uh, so the formalization of this is the December 6th meeting where they basically attack everything to do with numbers. Right. right. Correct. So, so the one here that I put the School of the Prophets as being the sale. I, I don't know if that's really a good one at all. Um, I don't know. That, there are other things we could put in there. Um, you know, so there are things that follow after. Um, and so I don't know. I don't know specifically how to. Um, and, and in here, too, if this is 1A, remember, there's an increase of darkness. So from that October 30 meeting, when they, you know, they, they set up this committee to examine uh, July 18th, all kinds of darkness are presented. Um, that is truth mixed with error. In, in particular, uh, we had um, Noel and his wife, they, they wrote, his wife specifically wrote a paper against time setting, which was, was basically correct. But the problem here is the misrepresentations against the truth. I read over some of the emails that I had with people and people were not interested in understanding what was actually being said or taught. Uh, they were trying to find fault. And okay. um, so, so they weren't looking at what was being said. And I read, uh, uh, email exchange with Bronwyn where she had attacked my paper on July 18th. Um, I'm, you know, that is called after July 18th and totally misrepresented every single point in her response to that uh, article. Okay. Now there was a very good comment from the chat. Yeah. Um, where you have 813 right now. Yeah. A complimentary number for that would be 187. Added together, you come out with 1,000. Yeah. Yeah, so... Right. If you add these together, it's 1,000. Oh, wow. Right, so that's something we... It's known for a while regarding 813 Palmoni is it does also complement... Um, July 18th, the 187 somewhere. Right. Which, is, which is, is very powerful in and of itself. 
and, and of course, we know that this 1-8 symbol has come from, from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. That's where this symbol really comes from, because the Day of Atonement is on, on the 187th day of the year. So, so this is something that's built into Adventism um, and into, into the Bible, right? So when we came up with July 18th, we knew none of this type of things. We weren't, we weren't looking for these things. I mean, we knew, of course, the 187, but we weren't doing it because of that. July 18th arose without us really understanding how it was connected. But anyway, this is interesting because this is an attack on July 18th, and it happens on 13th day of the eighth month. So, um, so that's an extremely important point. Now, as far as the declaration, we know that the symbol there is 126, right? The sixth day of the 12th month. 12 months, six day, one, two, six. So we have an attack upon uh, the symbol for the 2520. Right. And, and also, even if we took that and multiplied it by 20, um, we have 2520. But we also have two 20s there, right? So we have this doubling as well. So you could, if you understand what I'm saying. So this is a doubling of 20, 2020. And it's going to be on the 12 month sixth day. And so this, this represents here the 2520. Now, so whatever the empowerment of this message is, the reason why I'm, I put the school of the prophet sale there is that this is, this is basically marking the end of FFA, right? Now I'm lining this up with Abimelech being king, so I would say the sale of the school of the prophets as an empowerment of this message. So once you have rejected the foundation, then you're going to have uh, ultimately the whole purpose of this movement was this train of people, the school of the prophets. So the school of the prophets symbolizes uh, training us to understand prophecy, right? To be workers for God. And so once that school school is sold, it's really for me, it was personally the end of FFA, whether that, that's the best event. And I can't remember the date. I mean, we know it was put up for sale in January, but it was sold fairly soon afterwards. So if anybody can find that date, that would be wonderful. I just don't have it. Um, it used to say actually on the internet, when it was sold, it said it was sold on such and such a date. And so you can look. No, it would be in um, uh, your WhatsApp on your phone. But I think you got a new phone since then. So I'm not sure how that works, whether it's on your old phone. So it might be deleted from our information. Right. So then. Um, then we, we have December 25th, 2021. That's the end of our line. Right? That's the end of the 777 days. And, and we have um, two things that happen. Of course, Colin does his presentation on December 25th regarding Trump. Now, to say that this is the arrival of the second angel, we would have to understand how that relates uh, above now here this is in response to this message of Abimelech but it's really the, under the same spirit and so we take this this message of Abimelech is connected to uh, the message of Parminder that is when we look at what's happening here in the movement uh, this is really re the repetition of Parminder's uh, message and one of the things that Parminder wanted to do was to get the school of the prophets. And, um, but he doesn't end up with it. It ends up being sold to somebody else who's still now trying to sell it. Um, so whoever bought it just bought it because it was cheap and thought they could turn it over for a profit. Uh, no pun intended. But um, so we have Colin's presentation there of December 25th. But on the bottom, what we're looking at here is 
this message of Jotham, right? So this is the parable of the trees. And what we, we did is we looked at the foundation. This was examining the foundation in 187 presentations that began on March 7th. Now, March 7th, of course, is a symbol of the Sunday law. And this is March 7th, 2021. So that's 1700 years after the Sunday law in 321, right? So, so we should be able to recognize that. And then um, after Colin's presentation, the next day, we begin this present study, understanding the lines. And so this understanding the lines is continuing. And, and that began on December 26th, of course. And um, in that we have these, these dates underneath there that are extension of what the message of Jonathan or, or Jotham, pardon me, Jotham is about. So the message of Jotham is about this date. And we had this extension of time. So on, on the line above, we have Odilio's presentation on February 12th. And both Colin and Odilio are addressing the, the election on November 8th, though Odilio's is more about the pandemic. But he still is saying that this is a test. We need to accept that Trump is going to become president and those that Wait till November 8th, they will have closed their probation if they rejected that message. So then we had uh, November 24th, which was this date, 16 days after November 8th. And we know that from uh, November 24th to um, uh, April 5th, 2030 is 2,688 days. I'm gonna Iran type that into uh, a Google search, what came up was um, the form 2688, which is an application for extension of time upon uh, filing your taxes. So um, extension of time. So we have this extension of time. Taxes symbolize the Sunday law because it symbolizes the state and the power of the state. And of course, 16 times 168 being a symbol for a week. And the fact that there's 16 days and then this 2688 um, okay. going to April 5th. So, so we have, have this on the bottom. Yeah. Okay. okay hold, hold for a second. Yeah. In the chat, Iran was able to find that the School of the Prophets sold on January 21st of 2021. Okay. So January 21st. Of 2021. Yeah, 21, 21. Yeah, so January 21st, 21. Okay, so 21 is a symbol of? Midnight. Right, so a symbol of midnight, okay. And it's, of course, doubled in this case, 21, 21. Mm -hmm. We might, you know, find something else about that. So the School of the Prophets is sold, right, and and... My idea that is this represents the 9-11 that is August 11th, 1840, that in taking Snow's letters, we know this is April 19th. And so we have this problem that Jeff and I resolved in understanding the two 9-11s, right? So that there was um, these two 9-11s uh, that we could look at depending which line we're in. And, and when Jeff and I discussed this, this was in 2018 before we had uh, the November 9th date, but we were just trying to understand Samuel Snow's letters in their context. And so we're saying the message of Jotham is going to begin after the scale, sale of the School of the Prophets, right? And that's gonna be this examining of the foundation, which gives us all of this understanding that's going to lead to us understanding uh, January 11th, April 5th, 2030. All those things are going to come from the examining of the foundation. And then we're going to have this, um, the next study as well. So we have these two uh, presentations or series, uh, examining the foundation and understanding the lines that are being marked by these dates. <clears throat> So uh, now is the School of the Prophets then 
would we take that sale, especially with the symbolic number there, as this empowerment? Is that is that sort of established that this is the way mark that ends with this? The attack of the of July eighteenth ends with the sale of the School of the Prophets. That could fit. Yeah. So was it actually sold on that date? Or was that when they put it up for sale? Because I know they put it up for sale. Uh, I thought it was in January. And how did you find out that information? Okay. The What, what was posted in the chat, um, the information was found by Zillow or found on Zillow, and it was uh, a sale date. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because I was kind of thinking it was in February, but I might not have heard of it until February, because I don't think I heard of it right when it happened. So, okay, yeah. So normally they will tell you, Americans are very strange. You can find a lot of information about people uh, where they've lived in the past, their birthdays, their relationships with other people, which you could not find on a Canadian, if you searched a Canadian, um, you wouldn't allow that kind of information to be shared, which I find kind of odd. Uh, it would be considered uh, an invasion of privacy, but but even a, a piece of property being sold, um, it would be pretty difficult in Canada to find that. You can, who owns property, but... Uh, but they have so much information about pieces of property on, on the internet for free in the United States. I find that interesting. But anyway, so, so would we agree with that, that the sale of the School of the Prophets would, um, well, the listing was on the 13th of January. Okay. That's interesting too. So it didn't take them very long to sell it. And we don't know who, who bought it, do we? It doesn't tell us that information. I thought I had heard that it was another ministry that had purchased it. Yeah, that might have been a rumor, though. Because whoever purchased it, do they still have it for sale, is my understanding. It's up for sale. But, you know, it, it could have been. Okay, so... Anything else about this line? Are, are we accepting that this this is that we have now in this movement? We have a date coming up uh, which we haven't addressed yet, uh, in particular. So we we have to look at, at that. Um, I mean, we dressed it a bit. That's the December twenty fourth date, right? That's going to be part of of Collins structure, but, um, but we have this extension of time, right? So from November 24th, uh, we get an understanding, um, and that's last Thursday. On Thursday, if you look at that presentation, you can see where we, we come to understand this. And so this is an extension of time, this April 5th, 2030 date. Okay, another very interesting point that Iran brings out. Yeah. Sale price was 18.7% below listing price. <laughs> of course it was. Oh, yeah. So. Uh, Great digging there. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I knew it was sold for less than what they listed it as. Um, so 18.7%. Okay, so this is 18.7% uh, below, so I guess you would go, if that makes sense. So the listing, so it was whatever um, these numbers are, what were the numbers? So what was the listing price? 
we could have that. Seven ninety nine five hundred. Right. And it was sold for six hundred fifty thousand. Okay. <clears throat> Six hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sixty five. Oh, six hundred and six five zero. That's what he had. Yeah, that's what I had, isn't it? I thought so. Okay, but no, you're what what I'm getting at. Sixty five. Oh, 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 oh. We both missed it. Yeah, okay. okay. This is so. No, six, no, no. Okay. six five zero with three zeros. Okay. But I'm getting at, don't we have a prediction from Isaiah 7 that unto 65 years shall Israel no longer be a people? Oh, I see what you're saying. So you're, you're just focusing on the 65. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I see what you're saying. Okay. And then whatever you subtract that from, um, you know, you could figure that out. I'm not going to do it right now. That's that's going to be below. Do we figure it out? Well, if you multiply, how would you do this? How many days did it take to um, sell it? Eight days. Seven. Eight Seven days. days. Okay. Eight. Well, 13 to the 21st. That's you want that. Money? Oh, yeah, it could be eight, I guess. Yeah. But if you just divide 650,000 over 799,500, then you get 0. 0.813000. Zero, zero. And so then, what did you take? Oh, oh, this is interesting because you get a repeating number. It's 0. 0.813008130813008100. Repeating forever. <laughs> wow. So eight one three. It's one eight seven eight one three zero zero. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. So it's. Yeah, anyway, that's pretty interesting. So so this sort of helps confirm uh, what we're talking about here, the scale, sale of the School of the Prophets. And there's going to be these eight days in here, right? So that eight days. Kind of confirms it, honey. Yeah. <laughs> so it's listed. Eight days later, it's sold. We know that number eight is this number that Jeff has continually focused upon. Um, so, so we have lots of different things here uh, that we can connect this to the line above as significant and, and to our structure, of course, with the two 9-11s. Uh, so there's all these things happening in this line, um, but where we're really focusing now, so we, we can see this past, and it's trying to understand what's actually coming. So we know that this movement is being giving a message of unity, which comes as a result of the upper room experience. But we know not everyone is gonna participate in that experience, sadly, right? But the focus is not you know, on the bad people and you know, we're right and they're wrong and all this type of thing, because we still, have this divorcement. And, and the thing that I was talking about is this call, right? So when we look at uh, 2 Chronicles 29 and 30, there's this work of the cleansing of, of the sanctuary by the priests and the Levites. But within this movement, symbolically, uh, this is being represented in these structures. And we know that um, uh, now that Colin's prediction has passed and we've come to this November 24th date, which is this application for the extension of time, his, his message was about the Sunday law. 
Now, I'm not saying April 5th, 2030 is the Sunday law, but I'm saying that it is a date that has been symbolically represented in 457 BC in all different kinds of ways, right? So it's the first day of the first month. It's the end of the story of Ezra coming to Jerusalem in 457 BC. And um, we also have the January 11th date, 2023, and that's going to be 2,640 days before April 5th, 2030. When we get to the end of January 11th, Colin's line ends, and his prediction will have not been finished. But we have another date in there, which is the December 24th date, and that's going to be um, uh, after November 8th. It's going to be 46 days to that date. And then there's the 19 days to January 11th. So that's that 46, 19. And so that's, I mean, that's what we're, we're trying to understand right now in this movement is how all of this, what, what it is we have to do, what our responsibility is. Does this, is there a call that is then made uh, to this movement? just as we make a call to the Levites later. That is, what happens in this movement is symbolic. It's a zoom in to some line, to some date. Um, and now we, we know that we had zoomed in um, on uh, 6, 7, and 8 of Judges. They zoomed into those dates on our line. Ch chapter 8 zoomed into uh, December 25th, but now... We have Judges chapter 9, and it's zooming into something on our line. It, would, and, it, would not, it, it, it wouldn't have to do with anything with uh, baptism and uh, circumcision, would it? Okay, explain what you're talking about. The eight the eight, days. The eight, it represents circumcision and baptism, right? Yeah. It does. It, it well. It represents resurrection because Christ resurrection. On, on the eighth I day. Just, I just curious. I'm sorry. Yeah. No. That's. I mean, it, it is part of the symbols dealing with the number eight. Now we could look at this as because Jeff does this with with these chiasms. Is he would put eight here and eight here, right? Somehow, and I don't know how we put eight on that side. There's probably a representation of eight. I know 16 is two times eight. So we have an eight and then we have a 16, which is this doubling. But the idea here is that we have a call that needs to be made to this movement. That is a message, which I think this is part of this, is this message to this movement. Um, and it's going to be the the Passover that happens in the second month. And we know that the Passover in the second month is an extension of time, is it not? Those that were defiled by a dead body or that were on a journey who couldn't participate in the first Passover, they have this opportunity in the Passover in the second month. So that is an extension of time. We would agree with that. Right. Right. So this message is this application for an extension of time. That's that's what April 5th, 2030 is about. Uh, that's what we've been uh, giving this, this opportunity. It's also the call to come to Jerusalem uh, to address the marriage to the strange wives. And that... that that gives us this April 5th, 2030 date as well. It's also reaching back into Millerite history because we know from the first day of the first month in 1844 to April 5th, 2030 is 187 years and 20 prophetic months. It's also 2300 lunar months. It's also the week of Christ gives us that date as the first day of the first month when we work backwards on the bottom with the dates on the top. So we get to 2030, it's the first day of the first month, April 5th, 2030.
So we have all of these witnesses about April 5th, 2030. And, and all of that is, that's happened since July 18th has led us to this understanding. Even before this, I mean, we had the April 5th, 2030 date back in 2018, before we had any of these other dates. I mean, in a sense, we had November 9th, it wasn't presented, but before any of them were presented, I had seen the April 5th, 2030 date. I just didn't, you know, accept it as any significance. But now we can see it as significant. Odilio's and Colin's presentations have connected this date with this movement. But we still have another date. That's the December 24th, 2022 date that's coming up. And then, of course, the January 11th, 2023 date. So those are the only dates I see on, on our line uh, immediately is, you know, basically uh, a few weeks away. And then this other one following. So I don't know. I don't know what we what we want to make of that. So, but anyway, we can see this. This this chart is pretty solid. I probably should draw it out in uh, PowerPoint. Right. So when we look at Colin's uh, line, his prophetic mirror here, um, we can see that we have this uh, this structure, and we have two different things: the November third. Uh, well, we have more than that, but two here that I want to point out: the November third, twenty twenty election, seven hundred and eighty-one days to December twenty-fourth. And from the siege of Washington, it's 718 days. Now, we also know that the siege of Washington, D.C. occurred um, 187 days after um, the, so let me see here. I'm going to put this up here. got to find this because we have lots of different periods of 187 days there's a lot lot more than than just this um so oops I'll get this up here i know there's lots of charts that i'm just going to flip through here quickly i'm trying to find a particular one these are all dealing with 1844 snow's letters Um, we have a lot of 187 days. Okay, so here's the one that in particular. So we have um, from the 100 days of prayer, right? So we had looked at this before, the 100 days of prayer, which is 144,000 minutes from March 27th, including July 4th. So at the end of July 4th, that 100 days of prayer ended. And then we have 13 days to July 18. 13 days is 18,720 minutes. But from that July 4th date, it was 187 days to the siege, right? And that was 13 days after the bombing in Nashville, which again is 18,720 minutes as a symbol. And then at the end of that 10, 10 days of prayer, we had that. January 16th date, that is 434 days after November 9th and 343 days before December 25th, 2021. <clears throat> but now we can look at this January 6th date and we can connect it to December 24th. Um, so this December 24th date, um, let's be this way. So I think I just did it like this, 12, 24. 
Right, so there we are. So we're back here to this chart. Now, the question is, how do we deal with a date that's in the future? Like, what is it that we, why do we have dates in the future? Why does God give us these dates? Because we're not making a prediction, right? They're way marks. Okay, they're way marks. So he gives us these dates in the future so that we have, as we walk along a path, we have, in a sense, something to guide us, right? And we can see that. So we're being connected back to the siege of Washington, D.C. in 718 days, and we can see that's a symbol of July 18. Um but it also connects us to this election on November 3rd, 2020. So what, what is this telling us about this 46 days after this midterm election on November 8th? Because this is, we have this 65 days, this prophetic mirror, 65 in, ordinal days. If we put this into Millerite history and we look at the prophetic mirror, this is, is the midterm election the time of the end? Yeah. People understand what I'm talking about. If this is, if this part on far to the right here, if this, if we take these days and apply a day for a year, what is this? It would be 1798, right? Okay, so we'd have 1798. And then the 46 would be 1844, right? And the 19 would lead us to 1863, correct? Because it's the end of the prophetic mirror. So, okay. Now, if we took a day for a year, um, where would uh, November 24th be? What year? So we have November 24th. Wouldn't that place at about 1833? No, place at 1812. Because November 24th is... Or not, no, no, 1814, pardon me. So it's going to be 16 days, right? Yep. So it'd be 1814. Is 1814 significant? Yeah, because that's that's the end point of the War of 1812. And the yep. war, the Battle of Lake Champlain. Okay, right. So you have the Battle of Lake Champlain in 1814. 18 times 14 is 252. Okay. So 18 times 14 is 252. So, so all I'm saying is that we can put the November 24th date in there and we can look at it as a symbol just where it lies within these 65 days. Now, of course, 1224 would be October 22nd, 1844. Right, I mean, it'd be 1844, but it's going to represent the close of probation in 1844, right? Because the 46 years ends October 22nd, 1844. 
Now, one of the things that Odilio had done is if we look at Odilio's study, which I'm, I'm not going to bring up here right now, but we will look at it um, in the future again. Odilio's study uses some of these same symbols uh, that I'm using here. That such as the 180 days being 18,720 hours. Um, and, and so he uses some of these, these symbols in his mandate study, right? So the study of the mandates. And um, so in that, so one of the things that I saw is this tied together Odilio study and uh, Colin study. Now, Colin didn't do this analysis, but I analyzed his study based upon Odilio's symbols. Now, Odilio claimed a close of probation. Um, now, I believe that, you know, when we, when we talk about a close of probation, all that is is there's, there's light that's given, and then when light is rejected, there comes a point where a person can no longer receive light. And, and what I'm saying is that we need to make a call to this movement. Now, December 24th is a Sabbath. Is it unreasonable to make an invitation to people in this movement to have a special Sabbath where we come together to study. That's not unreasonable at all. Now, when I say that, I don't think, you know, it just would be my regular email that we need, need to make personal invitations to those that we know and, and to the different people right, within the movement who are part of this movement that uh, we might look at as leaders um, in the movement and, and invite them to a special Sabbath. So we did something like that uh, in 2021. So now we're at 2022. And, and the question is, should we do that? Is that prudent? Is it needed? Is that forcing the issue or is it us looking at these lines and seeing that we have these symbols that are showing us that this is an invitation to the second Passover? And, and that is some people missed the first one, December 25th, and now they have, have they're invited to the second one. Because, you know, we were defiled by touching a dead body and we also, um, uh, people were on a journey, right, symbolically. Right, we're not talking literally here. It, does that seem reasonable? And that, that we've had this line that is basically the cleansing of the holy place and the most, and, the most holy place and the holy place, the cleansing of the temple that's being represented in what this movement has gone through in its study. I mean, I don't like this. <laughs> you know, it's not something I, I would want to do. You know, because it's, you know, you don't want to cause a conflict. But I think it shows that this, that this is, has happened to this movement. We've had this extension of time and we are making an invitation. The invitation still has to be made. Yeah. Okay, so we have to pray about this and we have to think about it, but we don't have a great deal of time. No, we don't. The problem or the, the point becomes if the invitation goes out and the invitation is again rejected, then it, it begins to show the depth really of what's happening within the rest of the movement. Yeah. yeah, and the attitude thereof. Yeah, yeah, but but you know this is for all of us. I mean, we also are being invited by God, 
to look at things, to examine things openly. And I know every time that I've tried to have a discussion, they will say, well, it's the Sabbath and it's not the place, right? But of course, there is no place for the discussion to happen, right? And we know 1224 is a doubling. Right. So this is this is something that I think has to happen. Now, I don't know how this invitation would come about, whether, you know, we make the invitation during their meetings uh, or how we do this, whether we write people. I mean, I still would like to have Brother Toby do a presentation. Which is what I wanted last Christmas, but whether he's willing to do something like that, I don't know. So, but we're making an invitation right now to anybody who's watching these presentations. Um, and we're asking people to invite people. So somehow we have to plan something for that Sabbath, um, which I would like to see the entire day. Okay. Because we need to we need to examine these things as a group. Right. We need to have those discussions that we have not had in the past year and even before. Any more thoughts on this, this part of it? Well, I think you've laid it out fairly directly. Yeah, and I, and I don't think it's something that, you know, that we've manufactured. Definitely not. Right. It's just it becomes clear to us in our studies of what what's actually been happening. Right. So when we we look at this. Um, and so when we look at this curse of Jotham, the son of Jeroboam. Um, this is this is a curse upon a message, not upon people in our context. Right. The men of Shepkin aren't, aren't representing people. They're representing a message. And, and we haven't had everything. I mean, I don't know what's going on with how people are looking at Colin's prediction within the movement. Um, whether there are people who are really opposed to it. Um, uh, now that it's failed, that they want to move on. I don't know. I know Colin seems to be doubling down, but it seems to me that the movement is heading for a conflict itself, within itself. And, and but we need we need this message that God has been giving us regarding the upper room, regarding our natures, our characters. And so somehow we have to we have to pray about this and and allow god to lead in how this is going to occur but it has to happen in some way you know the conflicts in this movement need to end So as far as, as Judges chapter 9, I can't think of what more we could look at. Um, is there any other points that, that need to be clarified before we move to chapter 10? What and how would we see the young man that is his armor bearer? Okay, so we know that Jotham is slayed by this young man that's his armor bearer. And that's the word of, or not Jotham, <clears throat> Amalek. Right. Yes. And, um, 
And this message of Jotham, we had looked at as um, what was going to happen in people turning against Abimelech. But this armor bearer, I mean, he's going to put to end this message with a sword, which represents the word of God. But he's also hit with Miller's rules in the head. Right? Right. So, um, so I don't know what that means particularly. I mean, I'm not sure how that comes about, but it there is a part to play here. What I'm what I think uh, is happening is that there is a part to play here in this movement for the people who have been silent that are represented by the young men or the young man. That it's an armor bearer, that there's people who were supporting this message, who were naive, and now recognize that this message needs to come to an end. Okay. <clears throat> so you wouldn't say that the young man, the armor bearer, was another message. Well, it is a message, yeah. <clears throat> but but and 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 we have a hard time sometimes separating the messages. Uh, but there is a message that comes from a certain location, and it's based upon the word of God. Okay. So you know, we have Jotham, which is we're saying that this message of Jotham has been these studies, but I'm saying that there is. There has to be a message that comes from the message of Abimelech that's connected to the message of Abimelech that's going to bring about the death of that message. So when it's a young man, it, it represents some something new that's brought into the picture, but it's not going to be brought from us studying it. It's something that's brought from those that have accepted the message of Abimelech. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm I'm just like you. I'm trying to work through this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but I think it is an important point to bring up because I mean I don't know what it means, but but part of this conflict that has occurred against Abimelech, right? That we see here in the story of Judges chapter nine, the end of Abimelech, um, is something that's with internal within those that are accepting the message of Abimelech, right? I mean, Jotham gives a prophecy, but Jotham, Jotham does not kill Abimelech. No, but Jotham is also recognizing that what Abimelech has done is going to come back to bite him. Right. Yeah. So, so we know that this is, and after Abimelech dies, every man's going to go back unto his place. So, so this message that sort of united, to some degree, uh, the movement, the message of Trump, when that message is dead, this movement is going to uh, end that message. Right. And and this is this is the right. the payback for what he did for slaying the 70 brethren, which is a message, of course, of chronology. So the curse of Jotham comes to pass. So, so something happens within the movement. I don't think this is something we have control over. Um, it's going to happen within the movement itself. So one of the things I would say, you know, the thing that I've been waiting for, I guess, is, is God to work and operate in his way rather than me as an individual, even though I see all these things, you know, sort of running ahead. 
I never want to create a conflict. I never want to do something that um, is going to cause a problem. Because, you know, lots of times you, you think you want to act, you want to do something about the situation. And when you pray about it, God just says, be patient. You know, he's taking care of the situation. And we can see that with the lines themselves. But the lines themselves um, show us what God is doing. Because these are, are, are God's judgments and his righteousness that are being worked out. Correct? Right. And so, so when we look at this, this young man who, who slays Abimelech, this is something out of our control. This isn't something we do. This is a message that comes out of the failure of Abimelech's prophecy. Right? It is within the movement. Colin's prophecy has failed. He's still sort of doubling down. That's what Abimelech does. He's still going to finish the battle. I'm not saying that Colin is Abimelech. But I'm saying that message is symbolizing that. That the message wants to continue. But that message will come to an end. It doesn't say anything about Colin personally. What's going to happen to him. Um, but within that movement there is going to be an end put to that message somehow represented by the young man who's an armor bearer. Now what's, what's an armor bearer? Isn't that one that carries the shield? Okay. So he carries lots of things, not just the shield, but uh, other things as well. Sort of like a caddy, you know, for um, a golf pro. Um, yeah, so, so this just means to bear or lift up something prepared, that is, any apparatus, an implement, a utensil, dress, vessel, or weapon, or armor, artillery, anything like that. So, but when we think about, you know, the armor, this is what? What is the armor? I mean, we have put on the full armor of God, right? So we have the uh, sword, the shield, the helmet, the breastplate, uh, the, the feet, um, the belt, right? So we have all of these things in which we, and, and these are, are the tools of those who are studying God's word, right? Right. Okay. So, so he has this sword, which is God's word. And, and he's going to bring about the death of this message. And it's going to be brought about through the study of God's word. Would we take it that way? Are we going to take this armor bearer in a more negative sense? Because remember, he gets hit in the head with the millstone. That's Miller's rules. Right. But then also he's put through with a sword. That's God's word. And it's a young man who's his armor bearer that's going to do this. Are we not told that we need to be as little children? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this here is, uh, the word young man is, uh, concretely a boy from the age of if infancy to adolescence by implica implication a servant so so this is a young man as it says this is not um, this is not a, a full grown man So I think this would represent a message within this movement that comes from the study of the word of God, but it's also, it's not the leadership. 
it comes in a sense as a grassroots uh, understanding. That is, what I believe is that God is going to do some things that we aren't really a part of. Because we've been praying that God will do something. Now, we have a part to play. Doesn't mean we don't. But God is working upon people's hearts in this movement. Correct? Right. So, so we need to accept that. We need to accept that God is the one that works. We, we have a part to play. But we are not the one that the ones that bring this about. But what we have is to make an invitation, right, to study. That's our responsibility. But we can't, can't work upon people's hearts. We can't, um, you know, I don't think it's it's our study that brings about the end of Colin's prediction. But it's something else. God takes this work into his hands. He is our king. He's not asking us to take this work into our own hands. We cooperate with him as he leads us. And it's all done in the spirit of Christ. And so this curse of Jotham, which is what we have studied, that is, the curse of Jotham is predicting what's going to happen, but it's not causing what's going to happen. Can we say it that way? So the message of Jotham, which is the study of the foundation, examining the foundation, and also understanding the lines, shows that this is going to happen. But it doesn't cause it to happen. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because Jotham, he's the prophecy of the 70th week, right? And he gives his parable, but he doesn't, he doesn't act beyond that, does he? Right? He doesn't come. He doesn't get involved in a battle. He's not going to slay Abimelech. And so that shows us our responsibility, Right? So these, so these are things we're going to have to pray about so that we fully understand them, that we do the right thing. Okay, so we're just going to look at um, chapter 10 now. And after Abimelech, okay. Um, so Iran makes a note here. Um, about the school of the prophets listing that it had 10, 10 bedrooms and seven baths, right? So we know that's the 10th day of the seventh month is the 187th day of the biblical year. So it's just another little note. Um, okay. So now we have, uh, we want to look at chapter 10. And after Abimelech there arose to defend Israel, Tola, the son of Pua, and the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, and he dwelt in Shamir in Mount Ephraim. And he judged Israel twenty and three years and died and was buried in Shamir. And after him arose Jair, a Gileadite, and judged Israel twenty and two years 
And he had 30 sons that rode on 30 ass colts, and they had 30 cities, which are called Havoth Jair, unto this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And Jair died and was buried in Kaman. So how did we deal with Tola and Jair? Do you remember? Because remember, we're going to have, here, I'm going to just go on and read this. So we're going to come back to this. Um, you know, we're going to go, go through this and try to address Judges chapter 10. Uh, and the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam and Ashtoreth and the gods of Syria and the gods of Zidon and the gods of Moab and the gods of the children of Ammon. And the gods of the Philistines and forsook the Lord and served not him. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the children of Ammon. So you're going to have both on the east and the west. And that year they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel 18 years. And all the children of Israel that were on the other side, Jordan, in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. Moreover, the children of Ammon passed over Jordan to fight against, also against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was sore distressed. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, we have, we have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and also served Balaam. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, did not I deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites? from the children of Ammon and from the Philistines, the Zidonians also and the Amalekites and the Minoites did oppress you and ye cried to me and I delivered you out of their hand. Yet ye have forsaken me and served other gods, wherefore I will deliver you no more. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, we have sinned, do thou unto us, Whatsoever seemeth good unto thee, deliver us only, we pray thee, this day. And they put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord, and his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. Then the children of Ammon were gathered together and encamped in Gilead, and the children of Israel assembled themselves together and encamped in Mizpah. And the people and princes of Gilead said one to another, What man is he that will begin to fight against the children of Ammon? And he shall be the head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Right. And then we're going to have Jephthah. Right. So. So we know that this says after Abimelech, there arose to defend Israel, told of the son of Pua. And so far, when we've dealt with these with Judges chapter uh, two, giving us this idea that this goes from. Uh, 2001 to 2023. Um, we know that 2023, of course, uh, brings us to January 11th. But would this be talking about this movement after that time? Or is it talking about something else? What is this period of further disobedience and oppression? Where would we place this on these lines? Are we going to continue to move through history with these, or is there some repeat and enlarge going on with Judges chapter 10 and 11, right, and, and 12, right? So we're going to get, so we now have the story of Jephthah for three chapters after we did Tola and J.R., and we, and we still, where we're going to place this, um, we have two symbols. I mean, we have 23 years and 22 years. So why do we have 23 and 22? So let's go back to Tola and Jaya before we get to this further disobedience and oppression. So what's 23 a symbol of?
For 23, relate to the 2300 days. Okay, so we'll end with that. And 22? Wouldn't it be half of um, 46, too? That's half of 46, right? So we know the relationship between the 100, 2300 days and the 46 years. Yeah. So, yeah, they're related. And then we have 22 years, and that's a symbol of restoration. And then we have these 30 sons that rode on 30 ass colts, and they had 30 cities, which are called Havoth Jair unto this day. And that is um, Hamlets of Jair. And of course, Jair is um, dealing with, stay on here. Um, that. Um, uh, comes from this word, Yaur, which means wooded. So it's it's the village, um, which means uh, Havath, life giving by implication, an encampment, a village, a living place. So a living place in the woods, and. Um, we have 30 cities, 30 sons, 30 colts. These are in the land of Gideon. And he's, uh, J.R., when he dies, uh, he's buried in Kamen, which means an elevation. And, of course, we had Tola as well. So he's going to be in Mount Ephraim, Shamir, which means... Uh, a point or a thorn. So, so why do we have these here? We have after Abimelech, we have these two judges, Tola and Jair. 23 and 22 years. So that, of course, 22 plus 23 is 45. But of course, with Tola, he is the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, and, yeah. they, are, and they are of Issachar, right? Yeah. But he is someone of Issachar that that dwells in Mount Ephraim. Right. So what do we make of his father's name of Pua? That means splendid. And Dodo? And, and Dodo is, is his beloved. And Issachar. Now, Issachar was not one of Raquel's sons. Or was he? Was he, I mean, of the, um, the handmaiden? Um, yeah, so Issachar is... Yeah. Now we, we we know that Issachar also we dealt with um how do you spell Issachar here? Let me see. Issachar. So why is it not showing up? I double S. Yeah, I I just didn't do the capital. So when we dealt with Issachar, um it showed up in um a number of ways. So we know that he is um, he's going to be from Leah, so he's a son of Leah. His name means rec recompense or reward. And that um, when he receives his uh, blessing, he has this. Um, um, let me see here. Is the car? He's the strong ass coaching down between two burdens, right? So notice the 30 asses that we have there. Right. And so that's one of the symbols of Issachar. And we also related it to our lines itself um, because when we dealt with these tribes representing periods of times or days, 
um, we had it in So it's 54,400 days um, that I had uh, used to deal with Issachar. Um, and that brought me from July 18, 1870 to February 26, or it's February 22, 2024. Um, so whatever that means, that's where I marked it, because that is something that connects us to... Um, this is right, September 11th, 1814. So anyway, we, we have this Sikar there. We'll examine this a little bit further as well. So we're not going to just stop there. Um, but we have uh, Issachar, and he dwells in Mount Ephraim in this place called Shamir which means uh, a point or a thorn. Okay. Now, what does the spirit of prophecy have to say about this? I can't remember. We... Signs of the Times, 11 August of 1881. Okay. So, Signs of the Times, August 11th? Yes. <laughs> okay. Thought you'd uh, like that. Yeah. Signs of the Times, August 11th. 1881. Yeah. So after the death of Abimelech, here, I'll just look at this. Um, after the death of Abimelech, the, the usurper, the Lord raised up Tola to judge Israel. His peaceful reign presented a happy contrast to the stormy scenes through which the nation had been passing. It was not his work to lead armies to battle and to achieve victories over the enemies of Israel, as the former rulers had done. But his influence affected a closer union among the people and established the government upon a firmer basis. He restored order, law, and justice. Right. So this is what needs to happen to this movement, correct? Right. Now, the following paragraph. Unlike the proud and envious Abimelech, Tola's great desire was not to secure a position or honor for himself, but to improve the condition of his people. A man of deep humility, he felt that he could accomplish no great work, but he determined to perform with faithfulness his duty to God and to the people. He highly valued the privilege of divine worship and chose to dwell near the tabernacle that he might more often attend the services there performed. Mm -hmm. Now, it says oftener, and I change that to more often just because it's, I think it's better English. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, yeah, so, so anyway, we have this um, August 11th, 1881, so that's a mirror, and um, we obviously had looked at August, the August 4th one, right, uh, dealing with Abimelech himself, so it's just the next section, Um. But this is what has to happen within this movement, right? Yes, correct. This is this this is what we have been calling for. This uh, the restoration of order, law, and justice, and also um, a closer unity or union among the people. So, in in this situation, we're not looking to have a a ruler, a king, an administrator, we're looking for the increase of devotion. Right. And and then a working together. That's Correct. not done by, you know, setting up committees or anything like that to sort of accomplish a work, but just working together as Christians. Right. Cooperation. 
right? Instead of being at odds with each other. And so this is the character that we each need to have. Right. This movement, in a sense, has to become Tola. And, and it also shows how we are to work in ministering to others. Because when it comes to spreading this message to the Levites, because that's the role that's given to this movement, it's not going to be done because we, we, you know, we got together, we organized, we got a bunch of money, uh, we created a bunch of pamphlets, uh, did a bunch of fancy videos, and... Um, you know, did lots of aggressive advertising, which which I see with a lot of ministries actually in uh, Adventism. They're looking for, um, they're they're promoting their message, but I don't think that that's what we're called upon to do. In that way, I'm not saying that you don't have videos and you don't do things, but I'm saying that um, people are doing their own work. And, and God is calling us to do a work that's uh, cooperative, that's complementary to one another, taking the abilities that, that we have and, and putting those things together to accomplish a work, not people pulling in their own direction. So there is a government, right, that's established upon a firmer basis but that right. basis is one of unity. And if we have order, law, and justice, that means um, we are guided by principle. And we treat one another as Christ treats us, as we would want to be treated. You know, the one thing that I see quite clearly is that God can work in a powerful way if you allow him to. And that we often get in the way of God's working. So, you know, these are things we need to consider as we decide how we are going to approach what's happening. You know, in, in the next few weeks. Okay, so I think we can stop there and we can pick this up tomorrow and, and, and try to figure out where we place this. But I think we can see much more clearly now where we can place these things, that this is representing a work that's coming very soon with the death of Abimelech. Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful for all that you do. And we are thankful, Lord, for the things that you have shown us. We are thankful for your divine providence, for the symbols that exist in the events that we are a part of, uh, that show your fingerprint, your hand, your guiding. We pray for each person. We know that we are in a battle, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. And Lord, we are lowly and in need of you, but this battle is yours. Help us to trust that you are taking care of these things that we have no control over. Uh, bless this movement and the people in it. Help us to follow and serve you where you lead. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.